tonight we're going to be talking about man in the middle attacks. Alright, so before we get into performing uh, a man in the middle attack, I'm going to talk just real quickly about how one works, uh, the three way handshake, and about how a man in the middle attack works. And then we're going to jump right into uh, performing one uh, using Kane and Abel. Alright, so just real quickly, uh, we need to talk about the three way handshake. When two machines want to talk to each other over a TCP connection. They both have to follow some steps before data transfer can happen. So in this case, let's say machine A wants to talk to machine B. Machine A will send a packet to machine B, known as the send packet. Well, in that packet, there is a sequence number that goes with the packet. For machine A, we'll just call it sequence X. Now, let's say machine B accepts the packet. The port is open. So machine B is going to accept the packet and has to let machine A know that it has the packet. So it's going to send a packet back. We call that the SENAC. It has the, the synchronized flag raised and it sends an acknowledgement. Now machine B also has a sequence number for its packets. We'll just call that Y. It also sends an acknowledgement number, which is machine A's sequence number plus one. Okay. To finish the three-way handshake, machine A needs to respond back. So it's going to respond back to machine B with an acknowledgement, in which case it's going to send its sequence number which is really the same as the acknowledgement number in the second part of the three-way handshake. And it's going to send an acknowledgement number, which is machine B's sequence number plus one. Okay. Once this happens, the SIN, the SINAC, and then the ACK, once that happens, now data transfer can start. So let's just drop some numbers in here so you can see how it works. Again, the steps are exactly the same. Machine A sends the send packet, and let's say their sequence is 100. When machine B answers them, they're going to send their sequence number, which is 70, and the acknowledgement number, which is 101. Machine A's sequence number plus 1. When machine A sends the acknowledgement to machine B, it keeps the same number. It's still 101 because that's machine A's sequence number. It doesn't increase it. But the acknowledgement number is 71, which is machine B's sequence number plus 1. This comes in very important when we start dealing with things like idle scans to use a zombie machine to hit the target machine to find out whether the port is open or not because we'll take a look to see if the number goes up by 1 or if the number goes up by 2. And I'm going to have a video on that shortly. Okay, so let's put this into play in the case of a man in the middle attack. Now, there's multiple ways to carry out a man in the middle attack. Uh, it can happen before the two machines even connect, um, or it can happen during the session. Um, the one I'm going to show uh, actually happens before the two machines even create a session. But let's say that Jim and Steve want to talk. Of course, they think. They're going to be con communicating this way, straight to each other. But an attacker is really in the middle. So while Jim and Steve believe they're just talking to each other, the attacker is actually controlling the conversation. They just don't know it. So every packet that Jim sends out, it goes to the attacker. Every packet that Steve sends out, it goes to the attacker. So this is how it works. Let's say that Jim and Steve want to communicate. And let's even put another step in here. They're going to do it with encryption. Well, of course they need to trade public keys. And we're only going to worry about one side here. But Jim's going to ask Steve for his public key. So he's going to send a packet out that just says, Steve, I need your public key. Well, the attacker is not going to do anything with that packet. He's just going to forward it on to Steve. Now, what Steve's going to do is, well, just what he was asked. He is going to take his public key and send it to Jim. Because remember, the public key is 
transmit it. The private key is never transmitted. The public key does the encryption. The private key does the decryption. So the attacker ends up with Steve's public key, the one that will encrypt. Well, this is where it gets interesting because the attacker is just going to hold on to Steve's key. He's not going to let it go anywhere. What he is then going to do, he's going to take his public key and transfer it to Jim. Now, Jim thinks he has Steve's key. That's what he asked for. He asked for a key. Well, he did get a key. It's just not, it's not Steve's. It's the attacker's key. Again, remember, this key that's being transmitted is the one that's going to do the encryption. So he sends his own key to Jim. So now Jim's going to do what he's supposed to do. He's going to encrypt all of his data with that key. Well, unfortunately, whatever he sends can be decrypted because it's encrypted with the attacker's public key. The attacker has his own private key, so he can decrypt that data. So now he can read everything that comes from Jim even though it's encrypted. Now he can modify this data or he can just read it and then pass it on. But for this to work and without Steve knowing that anything's going on, when the attacker decrypts the data and modifies it or reads it or whatever, he then needs to encrypt it again but with Steve's public key. And now Steve will get an encrypted packet with the right key. In which case Steve's machine will decrypt it because he has his own public key. He has his own private key. And he doesn't know any different. So Jim knows that he's encrypting the data. Steve is decrypting the data. What they don't know is that Jim's encrypting with the wrong key. And the key is being switched in the middle of the payload. So that's the way it works. The, the big step here is the second step where the attacker holds on to Steve's public key and then transfers his own public key to Jim. Because now Jim is encrypting with the wrong key, in which case the attacker can decrypt it, read the contents, change the contents, and then encrypt it with the correct public key and then send it to Steve, in which case he decrypts it with his private key. So that's how it works. So I am going to uh, start up these virtuals here and show you how to do a very simple man-in-the-middle attack using Kane and Abel. So hold on there for just a sec and we'll get this thing going. Alright, here we go everybody. We got the three virtuals up and running. We got a Windows 7 box, an XP box, and a Server 2008 box. And the Windows 7 box is going to be doing all the work. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch Kane. And this can do both of them. Kane will be able to uh, perform uh, a sniffer and do the man in the middle all at the same time. Okay, so here we go. First thing we're going to do, we're going to go to our sniffer tab. Now I'm going to remove anything I have in here because I'm going to show you how I captured those. Okay, and the first thing we have to do is we have to start our sniffer. I'm just going to put our NIC in promiscuous mode, allow it to scan the entire network to see any machines that are on our network. So I'm going to start the sniffer and I'm going to tell it to scan for it. I'm going to add to my list. I'm going to tell it to look for all hosts. And I'm just going to click on OK. It's going to scan the network I'm on. And it's going to come back with every machine that it finds. Well, here's the two we're going to deal with. 10 and 11. Okay. So now that we have some machines inside of there, we can go to the tab down here at the bottom that says APR. That's an ARP poison. So I'm going to switch to that tab. 
click in the box at the top and click on the add to list. I'm going to tell it to go between machine number 10 and machine number 11 and click OK. Now that's going to add it here but it's going to stay idle. Okay, so okay, so it's going to say idle. It's not doing anything right now. We don't see any packet transfers. What I have to do is click this button here. Start and stop the APR. It switches from idle to poisoning. Now we have packet numbers. So what you'll be able to see, let's say if I go to my server box and if I just say ping my XP box, you'll see that those packets are coming through. Okay. Now this goes both ways. I'm just going to do it from server to, to XP because XP is running a website as well as running an FTP site. So let's say I want to log in to a website that another machine is hosting and somebody's in the middle. Okay, so I'm going to go to the machine. And when that comes up, I'm going to put in my username and password, and we'll see what happens. And let me go ahead and make sure my virtual is active, and it is. There we go. Alright, there's my asked me for my username and password so I'm going to go ahead and put in my username and I'm going to put in my password and I'm going to submit it and we'll let that transfer and I'm successfully logged in okay. everything works fine everything works the way it's supposed to Okay. Now, I'll also, while I'm in here, I'll also do an FTP. So it's 192.168.1.10. Now, always try this out first. If you try to connect to a machine via FTP, and when it asks you for the username, before you try anything, try anonymous see if anonymous access is allowed. If they don't know how to set up an FTP site, when an FTP site is set up by default, anonymous is turned on. You have to actually turn it off. So try it first. It's still going to ask for a password, but that's really for identity. You can type in whatever you want to. And now I'm logged in. Okay, so let's see what Kane captured. So I'm going to switch to Kane. Now I'm still poisoning, but here's my passwords field down here at the bottom, my passwords tab. There we go. There's the FTP site. That's the one I just typed in. I typed in anonymous, and for the password I just typed in hacked. For the HTTP site, right there, that's the one I just typed in. Admin was the username and M at L3K was the password. Now it will even capture if they type in the wrong password of course. It's going to capture those too. It doesn't just capture successfuls. Uh, it captures anything that you type in. So anything that's transferred between those two machines will fall inside of here. I can get POP3s, um, I can get IMAPs, I can get ICQs, I can get SQL passwords, RADIUS passwords, and they'll all fall underneath of their respective group. 
I can even get uh, uh, pre auth keys and pre shared keys. Okay. So as long as I keep that on, I'm between those machines. Now when I'm done, of course I just turn it off. They'll go back to idle. If I ever want to turn it on again, I can click them and restart it, and I can poison them again. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off my sniffer here, so I'm not sniffing the entire network. So that is a man-in-the-middle attack, and exactly how they work. Okay, again, there's there's a ton of different ways to keep a man-in-the-middle attack from happening uh, in the exchange of the key if we use certificates along with the key then when the the key is shifted on the attacker's end when Steve's key is held and the attacker puts his in its place the certificate is going to become invalid so Jim is going to get a certificate error because it doesn't match the key so there are, are plenty of ways to stop man in the middle attacks unfortunately not a lot of people do it so that's how it works all right guys we're keeping an eye out on the next video i think the next one i'm uh i'm working on i've had a couple of people ask uh for me to show them how to install um some virtual machines uh cali and ubuntu uh so i think i'll show you how to install um cali 2016 that's going to be the next one i'm working on so hang around for it if you like the videos give it a, a thumbs up uh, subscribe to the channel. I'll be posting a lot more here shortly. And uh, until then, have a good night.